This is Cynthia Anderson, and I am back here for a live Q&A after a very long time. And I'm going to be talking about how, a question that came in, which is, how do we approach people with good news without making them feel pressured? So if you are joining the call, I would love for you to tell me where you're coming in from. This is a live q and I'd love for you to interact and uh, let me know what country or what city of the world you are joining from today. And if you have a question about how to make or multiply disciples, I would love to hear from you. And I don't have all the answers, that's for sure, but I've been involved in disciple multiplication and uh, starting movements of disciples for the last 30 years or so. So if I don't have the answer, I've probably at least faced the issue or coached somebody, worked with someone who has faced that before. So please do feel free to ask any question. You're welcome, um, as long as it's somewhat related to discipleship and disciple making or evangelism, I'm happy for you to ask that. So once again, as you come on the call, please be sure to let me know where you are joining in from and say hello, because I would love to greet you. All right, well, let's dive into this question that is here from Lydia. And she wrote this in quite a while ago. I've been super busy with the launch of the Multipliers Mindset book, which I hope you've got your copy of this, Thinking Differently About Discipleship. It's been out for a little over two weeks now, and I am so excited about what God is beginning to do through this book and people's lives, the reviews that are coming in, people that are, that are saying, I tried to go slow, but I can't put it down. And God is just using it in people's lives to shift their thinking about multiplication and about, about God and ourselves and about how to make disciples. And so I am super, super thankful for what God is doing through this book. I, I'll admit it, I'm a little bit tired. It's been a fall, fall month. Um, launching a book is no piece of cake, but God, um, God has been with us and we've seen amazing things happen. So I'm so, so thankful for what he's doing. But I do know I've kind of neglected my community a little bit with the focus on the book. So this morning as I was praying, I was just like, I have to get back on and reconnect with people and make myself available, answer questions. And I just want to be in touch with you guys again in a different kind of way and talking about something besides the book. Because I know the book answers a lot of questions, but there's a lot of other things that are on your minds and questions in your hearts. So again, Lydia wrote this in a while ago. My apologies, Lydia, if you're listening to this, that I wasn't able to answer it question the question earlier, but she says this, she says, you meet a new believer or a group of new believers or totally new people who haven't heard the good news. Which scriptures about Jesus must we talk about? And then she asks this question, which is the key thing I really want to speak to is how do we approach people with good news without putting too much pressure? How do we make sure? And she has some other questions. We'll come to those in a minute, right? But we don't want people to feel pressured. And you know what? Nobody likes to be preached at. I don't <laughs> I don't like to feel like someone is in my face trying to convince me to do something that I don't want to do. And you know, and that is really not offering people good news, is it? You know, it's not good news to them that you're in their face trying to push them to change to a different religion or try to change and stop doing things that they have found um enjoyable in their life or something like that, right? We're not there to pressurize people. We are there to offer them the good news of Jesus. And I think one of the best ways that we can do that is, is number one, to ask good questions. We need to be good question askers and we need to learn to listen well. Someone recently told me that the lost will tell you where they are lost. And I thought that was so good. It's so true. If you will be a good listener, and somebody who shows genuine interest and genuine love and care and concern for people around you, and you learn to listen well, people will tell you where they are lost. And then that will give you a bridge and an opportunity to speak life and truth and maybe scripture or tell a story from the Bible or a story from your own life of how God has met you in those areas of brokenness or pain or difficulties. So 
again, you know, let's get out of preachy mode, right? Nobody likes preachy mode, <laughs> right? The pre preaching is fine from a pulpit, but it doesn't work with your neighbor or your, your brother-in-law or, you know, people around you. So let's be the image of Jesus. Let's, let's imitate him well and represent him well by being the most compassionate, loving, caring people out there. And um, representing Christ so that the aroma of Jesus is coming off of us to the world around us. And, you know, when we are um, angry and, you know, um, when we are judgmental about people who are not believers in Jesus, it does not help make the aroma of Jesus come off of us. So we want to be people who are loving and caring and compassionate to those around us, genuinely good listeners. We show interest in people's lives and then they will, they will tell you um, about their problems or they will tell you about the things in their life that are going on and give you that opportunity. Now, I would also say we do need to be ready to share. And how, how do we get ready to share? Well, for me, I am not a natural evangelist. I'll be really honest. Sometimes I tell people I am a recovering non-evangelist, right? It does not come naturally to me by my personality or anything like that to open my mouth and talk to people who I don't know, especially about things that, you know, are intimate for me. Um, and my relationship with God is something very precious. So putting that out there is not something natural, but how have I prepared myself so that I will be ready to share with people around me? Well, the first one is we need to prepare in prayer. We need to be people who are regularly praying for the lost people around us, the people in our neighborhood, the people that are our relatives who don't know Jesus, the people in our workplace who don't know Jesus. And I find in my heart, if I am praying for people regularly, the chances that I will open my mouth and step into a situation where I have an opportunity to share about Jesus are much, much, much higher than if I just keep my mouth shut. Um, you know, then I mean, if I haven't been praying. So prayer is a huge key. And I really encourage you to make a, a lost and save list, or some people call it a, the lost I know list. Who are the people in your life who don't know Jesus? And even if you find it hard to talk to them about Jesus, could you start praying regularly for them? And as you begin to do that, I know that God is going to begin to open up your heart towards them and open up their heart towards you and towards the things of God. So prayer is the first step. Um, the second one in being ready is, you know, to actually practice sharing your testimony, your story of transformation. What was your life like before you knew Christ? How did you come to know Jesus? And how is your life different now? Those three things, right? Learn how to share that simple story of transformation that's taken place for you. And um, in a short, brief way, too, not like telling your whole life story for two hours to somebody. Most people don't want to hear that. But how can you share in a brief, short way your testimony and, and just share your story? Most people will not um, be offended if you share your experience right, of what God has done for you and what it's been like for you. And you can make it non, you know, pushy by just saying, you know, this has been my experience and this is what I have found to be true and and this is how it's changed me. You know, you don't have to force anyone to believe that, but just, you know, share what's real for you and what God has done in your life. And it may be how you got saved or it may be a recent testimony of his intervention in your life. So, uh, look for ways that you can share your testimony um, and don't be afraid to do that. And I also just want to say, like, if it doesn't go perfectly the first time, please don't be sad about that or frustrated. Of course, it's not going to go perfectly the first time. I mean, you may get really fortunate and the Holy Spirit may just come and really help you. Um, but for most people, doing evangelism, sharing your faith with others, it is a it is a skill that we have to grow in and it gets easier over time. It's a muscle that has to develop in our lives and the more we do it, the easier it becomes and the more natural it feels. Um, but it's going to feel a little awkward at first if you're not, you know, someone who has regularly been involved with that. But, uh, you know, let's not be pushy and um, we want to be persuasive. You know, Paul said that, you know, uh, he persuaded people. 
with the good news. And um, even uh, the king, uh, King Herod, I think he was, or, you know, one of the kings there, I forget, sorry, who it was, but he said, you have almost persuaded me to become a Christian there in the book of Acts. And, um, you know, Paul was very much persuading people to become followers of Jesus, but he wasn't pushy. He was persuasive. And there is a difference between those two things. So, I want to be persuasive, but I don't want to be pushy, but I do want to be bold. Okay, so let's let's just uh, try to keep those in tension, you know, as they work together. Don't be pushy, but be bold and be persuasive. And how can we be persuasive? I think mostly people hear our heart, right? If they think that you're trying to convert them to get your little, you know, notch on your belt or, you know, say, I led someone to Jesus and they, you know, no, that's not going to work. But if you are coming from a real genuine heart that says, I care about you and I've experienced something that's changed my life and I really want you to have this. I really want to see you free and, you know, experiencing the joy and love of Jesus as I do. And it's coming from a place of heart. People are going to be much more receptive to that if they hear your heart than if they are just um, thinking that you're trying to you're trying to make a convert out of them. Are you trying to uh, convince them, you know, of something to, to have the same opinion as you, you know, so to speak. So, yeah, I see some people coming on. Um, Gaurav, Smohan S. Mohan Gaurav, good to see you from India. Nice to see you here. And we have Hamza Bai. Where are you coming in from, Hamza? And I see a few other people on here. Go ahead and, and greet me. Let me know you're, where you are joining from today. And if there is a question that you have that you would like to ask about some of the things I've been saying or about anything to do with disciple making, please feel free to jump on and um, ask that question. So, yeah, so I hope I hope that's clear. Are you guys tracking with me, those of you who are on live? Um, we are persuasive but not pushy. And we share what we genuinely believe to be true. And as we do that, um, people are going to sense the authenticity in us. I recently read a story about a, a very famous um, showman. He was a magician who was working in Las Vegas. He is an atheist. And someone was at his show. And by the way, this, this man is um, uses bad language. And he's, he's very, you know, he's not a believer at all. But somebody at the show um, afterwards came up and said, you know, I just really feel like I'm supposed to give you a Bible. And so he handed him a Bible. And instead of being offended, this atheist, this is what he said. He said, how much do you have to hate someone to believe that they are going to hell and you have the way to eternal life and you still don't share it with them? How much do you have to hate them to be like that? And I thought that was so interesting. You know, I mean, how much do we hate people? That's the way they perceive it. If we genuinely believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that He, we have eternal life in him, and we have the answer, and we believe it with all our heart to be true, if we don't share it with others, they actually can perceive that as either it's not true, and we don't really believe it, we're just following some religious practice, or we don't care about them. We don't love them enough to share Jesus with them. Um, and so I was really struck by that statement. You know, the fact that if I do not share my faith with the people around me, what does that communicate to them? Maybe it actually communicates that I don't believe that message. Maybe it communicates that I don't really care about them. You know, so sometimes we assume that people don't want to hear it or, you know, they're a Hindu or a Buddhist or they're an atheist and they don't want to hear me talk to them about the Lord. But actually, our lack of um, willingness to step into those conversations and share how Jesus has worked in our lives, it comes across as not loving them. Isn't that interesting? I thought that was a fascinating statement. So we want to love people enough to open up our mouths and share what Jesus has done for us. Again, not in a pushy way, but in a persuasive way because we believe it to be true. Um, you know, I've been talking about my book and recently, you know, the other day I was in a coffee shop and I saw a friend and I said, hey, did you get a copy of my book? And she said, oh, I haven't got one yet. And I said, um, 
you know, I've got some in my car. Would you like one? And she, again, didn't really <laughs> respond, you know, that positively. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go get you a copy from, from my car. And I, and, you know, I got it and I sat it on the table and I said, you know, if, if you're not interested in it, don't worry about it. You, there's no pressure here, but I want, I wanted to tell you this, the, the content that is in this book is so life-changing and I believe in it so much. I would love for you to have a copy and if you can pay for it, great if you can't, but if you, if you think you'll read it, would you take it? And she said, Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, I would. I would love to have a copy. And she went ahead and paid me for it. Now, was I pushy? Maybe a little bit, but I so believe in the message that is in this book. I want everybody who's trying to make disciples. And I knew my friend was to have a copy of this and the content that's in it because I believe it's life changing. Now, if I care that much about my little book, how much more about the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to change and transform people for eternity? And yet, you know, sometimes we are so timid to not open our mouths and share about Jesus with people. So we want to be bold because we believe in the message and um, we don't want to be pushy. We want to invite people into conversations. We want to dialogue and we want to share from our heart. But we, we do want to be persuasive because the message we have to share is worth sharing. It saves and transforms people, not only in this life, but in the life to come forever and ever and for eternity. It is worth whatever it would cost us. It's the pearl of great price, Jesus is, and we want him to be known by everyone around us. So uh, let's, let's not be timid in sharing that message. Okay, she asked another question. Give me some feedback, by the way. Those of you who are watching, what do you think about what I'm saying? Any follow-up questions, feel free to share. This is the question. So how do we make sure that the decision of following Christ comes from their hearts? Okay, and this is, this is again, a key thing. So we always, and I'm always reminding people, we are not making converts, right? We are making disciples. Jesus never told us to go and make converts. He told us to go and make disciples. And then he said, baptize them and teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. So we are making disciples, not converts, which means our goal is not to get people to pray a sinner's prayer, right? And that in some ways has become so much the focus. Like if I can just preach at them and convince them to pray a prayer and they pray it, then that's a win. Hallelujah. Somebody got saved. And um, I'm not saying that's not good and that we shouldn't rejoice in that. I rejoice in that when that happens. But our goal is not just to get people to pray a prayer. Our goal is to invite them into following Jesus with us, right? To invite them to take a step to become a disciple of Jesus. If we search the scriptures, we never find a time where Jesus had someone pray a sinner's prayer. It's not in the Bible, right? <laughs> what did Jesus do? He said, come follow me. Come follow me and um, I will teach you, you know, the way of life. And so people left their nets. The fishermen left their nets. We see in Luke chapter five and they they said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And they they went with him. They followed him and followed his way. And when we invite people, we want to invite them to become a follower of Jesus. And what does that mean? It means that we invite them into a process, not into a decision. We're not making decisions. We're making disciples because people can pray a prayer and not become a disciple. And um, we want to explain what that means, you know, that uh, explain it from your own life. What is it meant for you to become a disciple of Jesus? Someone who is learning his way, who's learning from his life, who's in a relationship with him as your teacher, as your leader. And you're inviting them to meet Jesus, to, to adopt his way of life, and to turn away from their old way of life to make him their, uh, their Lord and Savior, the one who they are going to follow, uh, to learn how to live and to learn how to, uh, how to obey God and to learn how to have a right relationship with other, other people and with the world and with God. And so I think how we invite people is important. And 
Um, you know, I, I do intentionally want to de-emphasize the sinner's prayer. I prefer instead to invite people into a, a journey of learning about Jesus and um, asking them, would, would they like to read the Bible together? Would they like to learn more about the life of Jesus, who he is and what that means for them? And then as they begin to learn, then, um, you know, we can we can talk to them about what it means. Are you wanting to become a follower of Jesus? Are you ready to become a follower of Jesus? And if they say yes, often what I'll say is, well, you know, the natural next step that most people take when they decide to follow Jesus is to obey him by being baptized. And baptism is an outward sign of what God's going to do and is doing in your life as you um, as you've encountered him and decided to become his follower. So uh, we often don't say that people are actually disciples of Jesus until we see signs that they have chosen to obey, like I'm going to get baptized or I'm going to, um, you know, make that commitment to become a disciple of Jesus. So again, um, I think the invitation is important. Are we inviting people to pray a prayer and get their free ticket so they don't have to go to hell? <laughs> so many times that's how we've presented the gospel. Or are we inviting people to become a follower of and know Jesus and have become his follower and turn away from old ways of living to follow his way? So I hope that's helpful to you. Those of you who are listening, uh, Arsian Masi. Yeah, that sounds like an Indian name as well. Where are you coming in from, Arslan? Uh, Arslan or Arsian, and we have Fakia Nahid. Where are you joining from? Looks like some quite a lot of South Asians on today. That's awesome. I love South Asia. Okay, so I have another question here before we wrap up today, and that's the question came from Patrick Mbui. Uh, that again sounds like an African name. I'm not sure where Patrick's from, but. Patrick said, what is the meaning of discipleship? And again, I think that's an important thing for us to talk about and think about because we throw these Christian terms around a lot. What is it? What is discipleship? What does it mean to be a disciple? And I think it's helpful to actually define them. So um, I wanted to read from a uh it's a Campus Crusade article, and I'll put the link there in the chat for you guys. But it says this. It says, discipleship is a journey of intentional decisions leading to maturity in your relationship with Jesus so that you become more like him in your attitudes, focus, and ultimately behavior. It requires a commitment from the potential disciple and the disciple makers. So discipleship is a journey. It's a journey of taking intentional decisions step by step that lead us towards a, a deeper relationship with Jesus, a maturity that comes in our relationship with him. And I love how it talks about we become more like him, our attitudes, our focus, what's important to us and the way we behave, what we act is changing day by day as we get to know Jesus more. And um, in discipleship there, discipleship is the process of maturing in your faith. It says this down below, the, the process of maturing in your faith and becoming more like Jesus Christ, right? So it's discipleship is what we call that process of when someone's first introduced to Jesus to as they're maturing and growing as a disciple, sometimes we call that sanctification. Um, they are learning and growing, their life is changing and they are beginning to imitate Jesus better. Uh, they start to look like him, act like him, behave like him, obey him more and more in their lives as they grow through this process of discipleship. So tell me if that's helpful. I'll put the link there for you. That's what we mean when we talk about discipleship. And uh, there's, I also want to talk for a minute about what is a disciple. And again, I'm borrowing from some other uh, colleagues and friends um, I think Bobby Harrington from discipleship.org does one of the best jobs of defining a disciple. He says, a disciple is someone who is following Jesus, number one, being changed by Jesus, number two, and is committed to the mission of Jesus, number three. Okay, let me say them again. A disciple is someone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, 
and is committed to the mission of Jesus. And we find these in Matthew 4, 19. So these three things are all important. Jesus, when he called the disciples, he said, come follow me, come act like me, come behave like me, watch me, do what I do. Sometimes when I talk about discipleship, I, I play the game Simon Says with people, right? Do you know that game, Simon Says? Give me a yes in the chat if you know what I'm talking about. Simon says is where, you know, someone says, Simon says, raise your hand, and everybody raises their hand. Simon says, scratch your head, everyone scratches their head. Or Simon says, do a dance, you know, and they do a dance. And then someone will just say, um, touch your nose, and they touch their nose, and they forget to say Simon says, and then they're out, right? <laughs> this is the childhood game of Simon says. And yet, a lot of what disciple a disciple does is like the Simon Says game. Jesus says, scratch your head, okay? Jesus says, love your neighbor. We go, we love our neighbor. Jesus says, pray, we pray. What is Jesus saying to do? We're going to do those things. We are obedient. We're following him where our eyes are fixed on him. What is he like? Who is Jesus? And how can we be like him? We want to act like him. We want to imitate him. We want our lives to reflect him. So that is what a disciple is, someone who follows Jesus. And then that second part is important too. We're being changed by him. If your life is not being changed as you follow Jesus and you don't see transformation coming, then maybe you're not a disciple right? Because disciples are going to be changed by the word of God. They're going to be transformed. They're going to be in a continual process of getting closer to him, seeing his holiness and seeing our own unworthiness and sin in our lives and things that need to change and repenting and coming closer to him and being transformed. And then a disciple of Jesus is someone who is committed to his mission. You know, if we say that we love him, but we don't care about the things that matter to him. Again, I question whether or not we are really his disciples, right? We need to be people who value and love the things that he loves. So he loves lost people. That's a huge one. And he cares for the poor and he cares for the needy. He cares for the widows and he cares for the orphans. He has a huge compassion for those who are in brokenness and lostness. And that is his love. And if that is what matters to him, that is going to matter to us as well. And so we become like him and his mission becomes our mission. The things that he values become the things that we value. That's part of what it means to be a disciple. So, but what about what is a disciple maker? Let's also talk about that for a minute. What is a disciple maker? A disciple maker is somebody who is actively working to make disciples, right? It's pretty simple. But let me read again from Bobby Har Harrington, uh, his blog, what he wrote about this, because I love the way he worded it. A disciple of Jesus, a disciple maker is a disciple of Jesus who enters into relationships with people to intentionally help them follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and join the mission of Jesus, right? So a disciple, is, a disciple maker is just someone who is intentional about entering into relationships with people. They may be lost people or they may be people who are already saved, but they're entering these relationships for the purpose of helping these people to follow Jesus and to be changed by him and to join his mission. So he calls every single believer to be a disciple and a disciple maker. How do we know that? Because in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said what? He said, go, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teach them his commands. Is that what it says? Actually, no. It says, teach them to obey his commands. So our job as we are disciple makers is to train and teach people what the commands are, but even more than that, to teach them how to obey them. And we imitate Jesus and those who we're discipling can imitate us. And as they watch our lives and they learn from us, they're going to learn how to follow Jesus. That's what a disciple maker does. They're intentional about people that they are reaching out to, their friends, their neighbors, their family members who don't know Jesus. They are 
in intentionally introducing those people to the way of Jesus and saying, come follow Jesus. I'm following him. Come follow him with me. And then they show them what it means uh, to do that. And they're intentional of investing time into those people. I want to emphasize here, and this is in my book, right? Discipleship is a process. It's not a program. It's life on life. It's me investing in you. It's, it's a relationship that we have that goes far beyond a six week program or a six month program or whatever your program is. So discipleship is a process in people's lives that we need to engage in that is relational. It's life on life. It's more than a meeting. It's not just what you do every Wednesday night when you meet with this group of people in your class. Um, that's not discipleship. Discipleship is really engaging relationally with people in a deeper way than that. And if we make disciples really invest our lives and they and we train them to make more disciples, that's going to multiply and that's going to go far. So God bless you guys. Good to see you, Moses, here. And we have uh, Sadiq as well joining from Afghanistan. Great. Wonderful to have you guys here. God bless you. May he give you many new disciples as you share the love of Jesus. Again, not in a pushy way, but in a persuasive way, because we really do have good news for people. Jesus is everything in our lives, and he is worth sharing with others. And again, let's remember, if we love people, we'll be willing to share about him with them. So God bless you guys. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll be back here again next week. I'm not quite sure the day, but I will announce it on the page. So just watch for that. And uh, God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. Keep in touch. If you've got questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And um, my secretary will be sure to give those to me so I can be sure to focus on them the next time I do a Q&A. Blessings. Have a great rest of the weekend.